Usually when I respond to apologists, I'll focus on like one particular clip. But since Frank Turek puts out so much content that is so wrong, I thought it'd be fun to put some responses to his short form content into one video. So buckle up. We all want to be mm. taken from the broken world. We want we want the bad guys to be punished and we want to be taken to a place of bliss. And I love what C.S. Lewis said about this. He said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world mm. can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. That's mm. what C.S. Lewis is saying, and I think that's true. So we don't want the world to suck. We want people to get what they deserve, and we want to be happy forever. These desires can't be fulfilled in this world, so the existence of a world where they can is the best explanation for us having those desires. I can see why, if you already have an array of supernatural beliefs, you might tell a story like this. But why on earth should this be convincing to a person who doesn't? From an evolutionary perspective, the satisfied uh, creature is kind of at a disadvantage in the mm. intense struggle for survival. It's not surprising that that happiness and contentment would inevitably be fleeting <laughs> in human life. We can account for the disposition to have unfulfilled desires about things that humans universally value pretty easily, all without needing to posit a god, another world, or anything like that. You need to remember that the Bible is written from an observer perspective. So there are times when it appears, say, God is angry with Israel and he's going to wipe Israel out, and then Moses goes and prays and appear, apparently changes God's mind from our perspective, right? But in reality, what's going on is that God always knew that Moses would pray, and he always knew that he would relent based on what Moses had done. When assessing Bible difficulties... Wait a minute. What the? Reginald, get out of here. Reginald, stop! Don't listen to him. There are no real difficulties in the Bible. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray for a hedge of protection around the viewer. No! Get away from me, you filthy skeptic! No! That guy's so annoying. <clears throat> As I was saying, when discussing particular kinds of Bible difficulties, people don't pay enough attention to our background knowledge. Look, the Bible is a diverse collection of books written by different authors over thousands of years. We should expect disagreement at certain points. So when we see the appearance of genuine disagreement among authors, and believe me, there's a lot of that in the Bible. Our default assumption should be that that's actually what's going on until given a reason to think otherwise. Isn't this just being biased against the Bible? Well, no. The scholarly consensus among the religious and irreligious alike is that the Bible is not inerrant in any kind of sense that people like Frank Turek need it to be. If anyone's got a crippling bias here, it's the fundamentalists who are trying to make the Bible into something it is very evidently not. Anyway, here's a list of a bunch of places God is depicted as changing his mind. Christian theologian Greg Boyd summarizes, Classical theologians usually argue that texts that attribute change to God describe how he appears to us. They do not depict God as he really is. It looks like God changed his mind, but he really didn't. Unfortunately for the classical interpretation, there are many texts that do not say or remotely imply that it looks like the Lord intended something and then changed his mind. Rather, the Lord himself tells us in the plainest terms possible that he intended one thing and then changed his mind and did something else. There's literally no reason not to take the text at face value unless you're trying to force a foreign interpretive framework onto ancient authors. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems that fewer people today care whether Christianity is true than care whether it is actually good. There seems to be a confusion here about how goodness relates to Christianity on Frank's own view. Consider. Premise 1. If Christianity is true, then it is good. Frank would have to accept this. Premise 2. Christianity is not good. Conclusion. Therefore, Christianity is not true. The point of spelling it out in an argument like this is to show that goodness is inseparably linked to the truth of Christianity for people like Frank. So arguments against the goodness of Christianity are fundamentally arguments against Christianity itself on Frank's own view. So his framing of people's concerns doesn't really make any sense. Christianity is Jesus. It's not it's not based on the immoral behavior of, of some Christians. It's based on the truth of Jesus, the beauty of Jesus. Just because I'm not true and beautiful doesn't mean Jesus isn't true and beautiful. So that's not really true either. Again, on Frank's own view, if Christianity is true, then Christians are being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. If a person's experience with the church looks nothing remotely like that, then I see nothing wrong with that experience causing them to ask, what if there's nothing supernatural going on here at all? As Emerson Green puts it, Christianity is not limitlessly flexible in accounting for its meager moral fruits. If it was, it would make no strong predictions about the transformative power of Christ, the fruits of the Spirit, and the connection between Christianity and the good itself. Christianity does make such claims. 
which is why the data of meager moral fruits are better predicted by naturalism. So yeah, this is a real problem that can't just be brushed aside. 